This isn't just milk. It's computer chilled, robot extracted, mega dairy milk. These aren't just tomatoes. They're soil free, rapid growth, nutrient enriched tomatoes. This isn't just a big shop. It's a supermarket. Tonight, for every pound we spend in the shops, 55 pence goes to the supermarkets. But what are the consequences of our desire for cheap food? This is what an American mega dairy looks like, and it could soon be coming to a place near you. This is costing us in our landscape. This is costing us our, our food culture. This is changing the quality of the land that we walk on, potentially even the quality of the air that we breathe. I mean, this is big stuff. For some, the cost is personal. So I can't do it. I'm quite fussy about tomatoes. It's down to the big multiple retailer, the big supermarket. They hold the power in this country. What supermarkets have done is produced a fantastic range of quality food at very affordable prices and indeed healthier foods in a way that 50 years ago, 20 years ago, we couldn't possibly have. But is cheap food always what you expect from the wrapper? We test for Britishness. Ten traditional pork sausages produced in Britain. Um, got a Union Jack there. And cheap food is changing the face of our towns and cities. Panorama has a groundbreaking study to see just how fast the big four are really expanding. This is like an arms race. They are opening more space than ever before. They're all attacking each other and it's getting quite nasty. For centuries, our eating habits have been carved into our landscape. When I was a child, if I looked down from this kind of height, there was this mixed patchwork of dairy farms and cereals and lush green meadows. And a lot of that has started to go because we're going through what people are describing as a second agricultural revolution. And the people behind it are those multi-million pound companies who increasingly dictate the way that we eat. Or is it us? Because we're the ones who shop. Leicester has opened the first supermarket where you can very nearly drive up to the counter. The ticket at the barrier admits the customer to the car park. Fifty years ago, all innocence and excitement about a big shop with a car park on top. Itself. It's got everything, and every brand from A to X, but don't have X. Tesco had just built the biggest store in Europe, but there was still no sign of the retail supernova rumbling within. Shopping couldn't be easier. Just one snack, they still want your money. Half a century later, with record profits of £3.4 billion last year, Tesco is number one in top of the shops. The place every little helps, but every big new store helps even more. At number two, the Northern Store, now owned by the biggest retailer in the world, US giant Walmart. Patch your back pockets, everyone. That's Asda price. At number three, with almost 900 stores and part owned by the royal family of the oil-rich state of Qatar, hmm, taste the difference, it's Sainsbury's. And finally, at number four, it's been in the charts more than a hundred years, but it's still fresh for you every day. It's Morrison's. Over the last 10 years, the total grocery sector grew steadily. Over the next four years, it said the big four hope to build an extra 18 million square feet of supermarket space. Think of the football pitch at Wembley, then multiply it by 250. A capital war is being fought right now through a race for space and the retailers are all accelerating their opening programs so that we have got the biggest opening programs in UK retail history and that, that war is underway right now.
But that scale of expansion won't be greeted quietly. There's already been a series of grassroots movements, each starting independently of the next. These aren't anarchists, they're local people rattled by the relentless expansion of the Big Four. In a film like this, you might expect to hear from one of the Big Four about the national picture. But unfortunately, none of them wanted to take part. Instead, they suggested this man. I think supermarkets, I think the grocery sector has made a big contribution to life in the UK. I mean, first and foremost, of course, they've provided affordable, healthy choice of food in the UK. We have some of the lowest food prices in the UK uh, compared with other European countries, into, indeed compared with global prices. There are, of course, many benefits. 24-7 shopping, thousands of new jobs and affordable food. Who can say no to that? It's better. You've got more value for money and it's cheaper. It's uh, for a pay in the parways. Yeah. Especially this time of year, you're getting lots of bargains. I <laughs> Ah, uh, and these are on special offer today? Yes. Sometimes they do a lot of buy one, get one free, that type of stuff. And this one? <laughs> Buy one and get two free. Really? <laughs> yes. So you, you come in here for the special offers, don't you? Yes, I do. But here's the mystery. How can they keep giving us such great deals in the middle of an economic downturn? The raw materials for our food, wheat, sugar, rice, are all going up in price. And yet somehow the supermarkets shield us from that and continue at the same time making big profits for themselves. Let's take one product we all buy. Milk. It can now sell for less than the price of some bottled water. Beneath us is the open Lincolnshire countryside, and if you looked at the horizon, Right over there, most of this land could soon be operated by just one farm, a dairy farm. But it's not just any dairy, it's a mega dairy. Out on the nearby fields, I met the farmer with a loan of £34 million to build it. The dairy is going to be built predominantly in that field there, and it's obviously a large area because it's going to be the largest dairy farm in Western Europe. If it receives planning permission next spring, this is what it'll look like. There'll be nearly 4,000 cows kept mainly indoors. That's 30 times larger than the average UK dairy farm. Opponents are calling it battery farming for cows. He and his partners own 8,000 acres. But the cows will never graze here. They won't graze at all. The cows are going to be kept inside, and, and cows are supposed to be in fields. That's how we think of them. I totally believe that cows do not belong in fields anymore. We are very passionate about looking after our cows, and we can do a better job of looking after cows by predominantly keeping them indoors. We will treat these cows as individual. They're the lifeblood of our business. By having so many of them, even when milk prices are low, he hopes to make good money. Milk is the classic. We need to buy it every day, every couple of days. Andrew Sims is an economist who's no fan of the supermarkets. He's been studying them for years. So if they dominate the milk market, it means that you and I have to go back into their stores on a regular basis. So if they lose a little bit of money on milk, and it's actually probably the farmers rather than them who are, who are losing, well then they've got you for the rest of the shop as well. This is the image we all like to treasure of our British countryside, animals roaming free. But our thirst for cheap milk has had a trickle-down effect. Tony Gillett's family have been in the business for four generations. He keeps his cows in the traditional way, grazing in his Suffolk fields. Well, my father renamed some of them, and he liked flowers, so he... he named them, you know, like dianthus, well, and palms, and hollyberries, yeah. and things like that, yeah. Do you have a favourite? Not now. It would be so rude to say in front of the rest yeah, of them, yes, so tell me later secretly. I mean, 
He'll soon be saying goodbye to them. Tony's going out of business. He's in debt by a quarter of a million pounds, and he blames the supermarkets. They're driving down the price. But the right. consumers are content with that, aren't they? The consumers would pay a lot more, yes. They probably would, milk. but given yeah. the choice between expensive milk or cheap, most of us would say, give us the cheap, there's no difference. Well, that, that's very true, yes, yes. I'm afraid we're, all, we're probably all the same, when we're, you know, as a consumer, when we go to a supermarket. We're looking for a good deal. The cows arrive for their last milking, 73 of them. The UK's first mega dairy will be 50 times larger. Tony's been left behind. His costs have risen faster than the price he now gets for his milk. And it isn't just ending his dairy career. The same man has milked his herd for 10 years. There's going to be a lot of motions roll tonight. Not just among me, my son who helps me, and the owners. That's going to be an emotional time. Very sad. When you see the last one goes, what will go through your mind? Because, I mean, you know these personally. <laughs> you know, just try and be strong and... Sorry, I can't do it. I... It's all right. Cows, animals, that's my life. And I just don't know what I'm going to do next. So... It's the end of four generations of dairy farming. Tony's sister has only just managed to compose herself to come and watch. There's one that might cause a few problems. What's she called? <laughs> Her name is Primula, and she does not like being separated from the rest. How long have you been thinking about this moment for? and worrying about it? For several years now. When we first started milking here with, with this present herd, there were actually 22 uh, dairy herds in the Blythe Valley. Yes. And now we're the, the, we're the last ones to go. Really? Yes. The last ones? Yes, so, last I mean, ones. You, you really have held on mm -hmm. against the odds for longer than anybody else then? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a familiar scene in the dairy industry. Every day, a dairy farmer goes bust in England and Wales. Cheap foreign imports are taking over. By midnight, all the cows have been loaded. There's a long journey ahead. Tomorrow, Tony's going to auction. Primula, Hollyberry and the rest are to be split up and sold to the highest bidder. It's a gloomy day. Prices are low. Tony hardly makes a dent in his overdraft. But we're going to show him what the future of dairy farming might look like. Next time we meet up with Tony, it's in America. Hi, Tony. Hello, Paul. Good to see you. The US supermarkets sell milk even more cheaply than in the UK, and there have been consequences. We drive south through fields which used to be home to grazing cattle. Just two hours from Chicago, there's a mega dairy called Fair Oaks. They keep 30,000 cows down there. Every day, they produce two million pints of milk. Fair Oaks isn't just a farm, it's a theme park. Tony begins his tour just like 400,000 other visitors every year. Did you know chocolate milk has calcium? Drink it up, you don't need no alibi. Talk of something so good, be good for you. It's nutrition. One of those behind it is Dr. Gordy Jones, a vet and a mega dairy designer. Gordy's agreed to take us on a tour to the places the public never get to see. This is what might be coming to the UK. Wow. <laughs> what do you make of that? 
I'd say amazing. Yeah. You, yeah. You've never seen a view like this. Yeah, Everybody yeah. I've had that's been in the dairy industry looks and goes, my gosh, this is this is what I call the at the zoo at the zoo look. Only the at the zoo look is you're down here, you're like the zoo animal, and they're looking at you. This yeah. is a spot that hardly anybody comes to on our dairy. This yeah. is sort of the back door scene, and I wanted you to see this because dairymen never see this view where they look up at cows. Yeah. You've always looked down at cows or behind cows. Tony had been quiet since we arrived. Yeah. What do you think when you look at it, Tony? Well, I'm, I'm emotionally overcome, actually, really? yeah. Why? I can't speak. <laughs> I can't. I'm, I'm too far. It's just. At Fair Oaks, the milking never stops. The cows are always inside. No grass. Their feed is calculated by computer. Every drop of milk is monitored. Tony was struggling to come to terms with it, but not for the reasons we thought. It's so emotional. But, you know, you can see their faces, um, they're happy, they're, you can see they're happy. Yeah. You know there'll be people watching at home who will say, it looks like a factory, they look like units of production, these cows. Mm. And yet you as a cowman, how do you feel when you see them? I can see that people probably would say that, but, um, you know, this is, this is the way that probably the um, milk is going to have to be produced. Everything at Fair Oaks is on a mega scale. Each cow eats 100 pounds of food every day. They drink 30 gallons of water and produce almost 70 pints of milk. But how do they know what they're doing? They all look, it looks as though there's no humans helping them. There are no humans helping them. So how do they know where to go? So on the day that a cow has her first baby, it takes us three milkings to train her to this. After milking, they're led here. Sheds a quarter of a mile long. Animal rights activists say it's cruel they never get to go outside. They'll vote not to go out there because we'll end up having these fans, we'll end up with this cooling water system, and the cow will go, I'm not going out there. The There'll be very few days the cows go outside. The cows belong inside. The cows belong well cared for. There are 80 births here every day. The calves are kept in tiny hutches, too small to be allowed in the UK. Tony isn't the only Brit at Fair Oaks today. We meet Peter Willis again. He's modelling his Lincolnshire mega dairy on this one. Supermarkets really have caused a situation, haven't they, where everybody's forced to achieve the best economies of scale and the best economies of scale mean go big. Supermarkets are businesses. Now if you're in any other business, um, you, economies rule. So you, you have to economize. And any other industry has either gone bigger or unfortunately they've gone out of business. Whether it's manufacturing, whether it's cars or anything else, that's just general business. So unfortunately that's the world we live in. Now why should agriculture be any different than any other business? End of the day, although we're looking after animals and we care passionately get about them, it still is a business. In the space of just three hours and still in mourning for his own herd, Tony's become a disciple. Well it's been a real eye-opener um, coming over here and look, looking at this. Um, the cows seem so relaxed and happy. Um, I'm, I'm just amazed that, you know, they can keep such fast numbers as this and, and look after them the way they do. In New York City, there's a campaigning journalist who says mega dairies are the result of the drive for cheap American food. David Kirby says they're not really farms at all. They're factories. Well, according to the dictionary, a factory is a uh, location of production that makes one thing uh, in uniformity without regard to individuality. And a farm is described as a tract of land with a house where people live, maybe a barn where plants and animals are raised for consumption by people. The first mega dairies arrived in America more than a decade ago. 
He says some unforeseen effects have worked their way through the system. The countryside is changing vastly because the small family farm is disappearing, being replaced by these giant factories, and you don't see the animals anymore because they're all inside, being kept in confinement uh, away from sunlight and fresh air, rather miserable. Back at Fair Oaks, there's another hidden cost to our cheap food. Dairy farming on this scale doesn't just produce lakes of milk, there's something else. Now just up here is what causes most of the controversy about mega dairies. This is what really winds up the protesters. And here it is, it's an enormous lake of cow excrement. And um, the protesters will say this attracts swarms of flies and that it smells appalling. But if you get a lot closer than we should do actually, and just crouch down here, I mean it's 80 degrees here today and uh, I haven't seen a single fly around here. And the smell, I can't smell anything. That's because Fair Oaks has these, digesters which extract the methane. The UK mega dairy would have the same. But what about the lagoon of slurry? It's got to go somewhere. In the growing season, they spray it on crops. There's nothing new about that. But it's the sheer volume which is causing concern. Back home in Lincolnshire, Peter Willis will need to dispose of 20 million gallons a year. This is where it'll go. But look beneath the spraying fields, there's an aquifer, a subterranean reservoir supplying 160,000 people. The government thinks the land can cope, and Peter Willis has spent a fortune ensuring the slurry's safe disposal. But what if there's an accident? That's what's worrying local protesters. Now imagine, just imagine one of those large lagoons, say the 30 million gallon lagoon, say something happened and the, the slurry was able to get into the aquifer. Well, that's water that people drink. Normally they spread the muck and probably a day or two days and then it's gone away, but this is going to be all year round, the muck is going to be spread because it's got to be, because there's so much of it. If it gets the go-ahead, the Nocton Dairy hopes to sell milk to the supermarkets, but none of them had signed up. In the village, some believe it's actually the big four themselves who've created a need for mega dairies. So what have we got here? Uh, this is a, uh, a homemade banner, if you like, against the proposed factory, battery dairy. Factory battery dairy. Battery dairy, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> OK. There you go. This looks like a sort of cow prison, the way you've got it. Well, that's is that the way you see it? how we see what it's going to be. And I think the, the big four supermarkets are behind this, where they can make cheap milk, cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. What's the matter with paying a few pence more to a traditional farmer and keep, you know, sort of the smaller, independent guys going and, and let them earn a living as well? It's all about our uh, cheap food again. There's a knock-on effect all the way through the food chain from what we pick off the supermarket shelves to the farms and the fields of rural Britain. A man who knows something about big food protests works out of this famous cottage in Devon. It's the HQ of chef and food writer Hugh Fernley Whittingstall. Such is the power of the supermarkets is that they are effectively rearranging the entire landscape to suit their business practices. You don't need to explain the attraction of cheap food. Everybody likes saving money. But the effects of that uh, simple drive to bring down price, uh, it's massively altering the way we produce food, the scale on which we produce food. Mega-scale chicken production. It's what Hughes campaigned against for years. They're the original battery animal and the reason some chickens are so cheap. But now there are plans to use industrial systems on other animals too. Like pigs. In Holland, one architect has been looking to a future in the skies. He wants tower blocks for pigs to save space. They're calling them sty scrapers, 
with playrooms and spectacular views, but at 2,000 feet tall, it's perhaps not surprising they haven't been built yet. As ever, the US has already arrived in the land of the mega. We're just flying over what they call America's hog belt. And uh, those, of course, are pigs to you and I. And in this state, there are more than 10 million of them. That's more pigs than there are people. But you won't see any of them when you look down there because they're not roaming around in fields or wallowing around in mud. These pigs are kept indoors. They're kept inside in the UK too, but not on this scale. Beneath the tin roofs are not just a few hundred pigs, but thousands of them. Look at those lagoons of slurry. But it's not like a mega dairy. This is about fattening them fast, racing them through the system from squeal to meal. Opposed to them is a member of one of America's elite political families. This is him 40 years ago at the funeral of his uncle, John F. Kennedy. He's Bobby Kennedy Jr., an environmental campaigner with mega pig farms in his sights. If you knew where your food was coming from and knew what those animals were going through, what the human beings, what the workers were going through, what the, the, the farmers who had been destroyed to make that factory profitable, you wouldn't, you wouldn't buy the food. We managed to get inside one in North Carolina. They don't exist in the UK yet, but Kennedy says they'll be the next form of battery farm to give us cheap pork. They don't get rooting opportunities. They don't get uh, sunlight. A hog is smarter than a dog. A hog needs those things in order to survive. And so they have to be dosed with large amounts of subtherapeutic antibiotics and hormones. They need to induce an explosive rate of growth. In the US, they're allowed to use antibiotics and feed them growth hormones. They grow from the size of a fist to a fully grown adult in just five months. In the vernacular, of course, we say factory farms, but there's an actual official US government designation called CAFO, C-A-F-O, which stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. I'd rather think of my food coming from a factory farm. At least it has the word farm in it. CAFO is about as Orwellian as it gets. Your food came from a feeding operation. This is where the feeding operation ends and the killing begins at the world's biggest abattoir in North Carolina. It slaughters more than 30,000 pigs every day. Cheap pork for anything from pizzas to ready meals. But again, there's a hidden cost. This is what a pig lagoon looks like up close. An Olympic swimming pool of pig excrement constantly filling. Again, it's got to go somewhere. There's a team of investigators in North Carolina who examine just where. They've caught farmers secretly spraying it into waterways because their own fields just can't cope. The team say it's led to the death of millions of fish. Within three years after this industry came here, this whole river changed. It went belly up. Billions of fish began to die. People began getting sick. The economy got hurt. Tourism went down. Property values went down. People couldn't sell houses. The pig industry says it's nothing to do with them. They rigorously defend their environmental credentials. But there's a protest movement, and it claims the scientific data points at polluting pigs. Rick says expect similar protests in Britain. I guarantee you this will happen in the UK. You let one of these facilities develop in the UK, it'll be like planting a bad weed. It's going to spread like crazy. If Rick's concerns are right, they worry me. He says, in America, animal welfare has been sacrificed in the drive for volume. And that some pig farms are so bloated, they're poisoning the land. Could the same happen in the UK? 
The British pig industry has been decimated by cheap foreign imports. Farmers here have to meet higher standards of animal welfare than in the US, and that's expensive. Overall, you wouldn't think this was a good time to go mega, but there's a futuristic pig farm planned here in Derbyshire. It'll be so big, there'll be a thousand piglets born every week. All those pigs are going to create a, a heck of a lot of excrement, but here they're going to use it for something green. The idea is to extract the heat from it and use it to power this building behind me. It could become the UK's first ever pig-powered prison. The man behind it has already constructed a prototype down the road. But it's light years from the American model. Bigger pens, heated floors and no growth hormones. They're not allowed in the UK. In some respects, the Hilton for pigs. And basically, we've got air-conditioned buildings, which it's going to be t a totally odourless production system. Recycling the waste is what will make their pork cheaper to produce. But they're still going to demand the same price from the supermarkets. Obviously, they think they can get it cheaper, so that's a problem. Yeah? Are they going to get it cheaper? Well, I hope not. It's a premium product. We should get more for it. Supermarkets would say, well, if they're cutting their costs, they can pass it on to the consumer. Cheaper meat all round. Yeah, why should the supermarkets always make the uh, highest margin? You know, we're at the end of the chain. We, you know, the, the, the consumer gives the, the pound to the retailer and they decide how much of it they're going to give to us. It should be the other way around. It's right at the heart of the battle over who gains from cheap food. Is it the supplier? Is it us? Or is it the supermarkets? There's a myth about our cheap food. We seem to think it's the supermarkets who are being generous with their two-for-ones and their special offers. But often, when they reduce the price, it's not the supermarkets who are taking the hit. They're passing some of the price cut back to their suppliers. They're the ones who are feeling the squeeze. Panorama approached dozens of them, but almost all were reluctant to speak openly in case they lost their contracts. One did agree, though. That's because he's David Handley, president of a group called Farmers for Action, and well known for his outspoken views about those who negotiate on behalf of the supermarkets, the buyers. There is such a fear of the power that these people hold over the industry. We've had producers who were growing carrots on what they called the so-called supermarket contract. Three days before they're due to harvest, they come along and say, sorry, we can get them cheaper from X. We don't want them unless you'll do it at that price. So what, what happens to the carrots? Well, basically, the first year it happened, the man had to accept it because he's got a massive investment. The second year, the man turned around and said, no, up yours and ploughed the lot in. He lost an awful lot of money, but the carrots were basically ploughed into the ground, they would rot away, and he would grow another crop. That's how powerful these individuals are. David Handley is a dairy farmer. He says he's negotiated with several of the leading supermarkets on milk. They tell you what they want, and then the phone would drop. And you are there sweating for a number of hours wondering whether you've got the order or not. Because this is perishable stuff. This you is perishable stuff. It. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, you get told very simply, this is the price we'll pay for it. You've got no negotiation. No negotiation has taken place. And that is it. Um, my, my experience is that totally different. Andy Bloor supplies Tesco with milk and sits on the TSDG. I mean, it's been a very long uh, process of building confidence from two sides, dealing with a major uh, retailer, Tesco. And is one of 800 hand-picked farmers with a contract to supply milk to Tesco's. He says they pay him enough to invest years into the future. Tesco, like the others, say they pride themselves in their strong relationships with suppliers. I wouldn't say it was the power of the supermarket. It's whether it's a supermarket or whoever you're dealing with, you, you know, irrespective of that, you've got to drive your business forward and be efficient. So you can't just suddenly sit with 30 cows and say, I'm going to sit here, Jack, and you will have to pay me X number of pounds and keep me a business. We're in the real world, we're in a commercial world. 
But the commercial world has been harsh to others. On an icy night in the Midlands, a group of farmers blockade a Tesco depot to stop the delivery lorries. They've done the same at other supermarkets. On the surface, they're protesting about milk prices, but really, this is about something bigger. It's about how some small producers claim they're being squeezed by the supermarkets. The delivery lorries are soon backing up down the road. Actually, Tesco pays its dairy farmers more than the rest of the big four. Why did you choose Tesco? Tesco would say, you know, you just take us as a generic bad boy supermarket. Actually, it's all supermarkets you've got to gripe with, haven't you? Tesco pay the best price. They're only supporting part of the dairy industry. What we're looking for here from now on is total support of the whole dairy industry in but the Tesco UK. Tesco can't support the whole dairy industry. Well, Tesco's and, and the other supermarkets then. After two hours, the blockade's lifted and the lorries let through. Tesco says it achieved nothing. Other suppliers have chosen to play the supermarkets at their own game by going mega. This is Thanet Earth, the UK's largest high-tech greenhouse. Even when it's snowing outside, six varieties of top-class tomatoes are ripening inside. They're grown hydroponically. Just plant feed, lights, sprays and computers. And an army of pickers. In terms of tomatoes, we pick something like two and a half million individual fruits each week. It's quite clear that the major supermarkets in, in the UK are A, becoming fewer and B, becoming bigger as the market grows. And that's what he's responded to, just like the mega dairy and the mega pig farm. He knows going big can mean cutting costs. Clearly, simple economies of scale mean that they can't deal with hundreds and hundreds of small suppliers. They are clearly attracted to dealing with a few large-scale producers who can deliver consistent quality, both in terms of appearance and eating quality and, and availability, because fundamentally, if it's not on the shelf, they can't sell it. Some more traditional growers are finding it hard to compete. 20 years ago, there were more than a thousand orchards like this. Now, there are just 300. The owner knows what it's like at the sharp end of the supermarket's fork. On the left is what many see as the Rolls Royce of apples. But the supermarkets want the one on the right, he says, just because it looks better. No russeting on that fruit at all. And Out shiny, slightly, waxy. Yeah, slightly uh, stripier, more block colour. And certainly that's most of what you'll see in the supermarket. This is a traditional Cox's Orange Pippin. You can see the tendency to be a bit russeted around the skin. But if you were going to decide which one you wanted to eat, there's no doubt about it that the traditional Cox's Orange Pippin will have a vastly better flavour. They go for this superficial quality of appearance, not for the taste. Certainly. He says the supermarkets dictate the shape, size, colour, everything. If a fruit doesn't meet their strict cosmetic requirements, it's out. If you took this bin as it is, we'd be lucky to get, I would say we'll be very lucky to get 70% into the supermarket. So about 30% of, of this kind of crop would go to waste. Yeah. And actually, the only thing that's wrong with it, if you like, is the mm -hmm. way that it looks. Yeah. It's entirely to do with appearance and colour. The supermarkets would say, we've never had it so good. It's cheaper than it's been before. It's more efficient the way that they sell it and uh, it's more accessible. It's, it's good for consumers. Consumers are actually paying more for less choice. And when you consider what's coming out of the middle, between the grower and the supermarket and at the end of the day, I think the consumer is worse off. The supermarkets deny they sacrifice taste for appearance. They say they're simply responding to what we want. Ugly fruit just doesn't sell. 
The story behind the cosmetic perfection of supermarket fruit and veg is one of massive wastage, of, of great piles of perfectly good, uh, well, more than perfect, often absolutely delicious, prime, nothing wrong with it at all, except in some bizarre sense, the, 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 some visual quality that, that the supermarkets insist we care about, that personally I, I, I don't really believe it. So we took the cosmetic superstars of food, purchased from the big four, and did a taste test. We played them off against some locally grown produce. On the bottom of each plate, it'll tell us whether it's supermarket or local store. A blind tasting, but which would we prefer? So if we start with the tomatoes over here and just taste them. So there's two plates there. And what's your initial impression when you look at those? Colour isn't everything, but the, the, that looks to me like a riper tomato and that looks a little bit anemic. Well, let's taste them, yeah? Well, it does taste good, though. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's very yeah. sweet and that's been picked at exactly the right moment, hasn't it, I would say? Yeah, it's not long ago. Mm. Blimey. That's just watery. I mean, that genuinely tastes of nothing to me. At all. So, so <laughs> really, it's that bad? I'm quite fussy about tomatoes. That had nothing for me. But it's interesting, isn't it? How can you make tomatoes that tasteless? Well, you're I going to flip over the plate now and show me that that's uh, from, <laughs> from, from the local farm shop. No, the won't. one we turn both over. preferred turned out to be... The colours and things. Let's just turn it over without destroying everything. Yeah, that local. is local. Locally grown. The one he spat out... Mm, supermarket. supermarket. No names. This is... Uh, Ham sandwich. Yeah, ham sandwich. So good of you to bring me lunch. <laughs> uh, he doesn't know it, but we're pitching a mid-range supermarket ham against some of his own posh stuff. That, that that is a better product. It's got a, you know, that is a pressed ham that's been machine sliced. Mm -hmm. That has got a much more natural grain to it. No, even I can see that. And, uh, I, I, you know, I don't really even want to eat that ham. Mm. Uh, that's got a lovely flavour. Mm, I would hope so, because I think this might be one of yours. Oh, is it really? <laughs> no, for goodness sake. The price differential, though, I think that's about twice the price of the supermarket one. Is it? And, and some people will say, luxury item, even though it does taste better and it's the real thing. I will not pretend that you can have good quality meat for the same price as intensively farmed, over-processed meat and meat you will pay more and for a ham you'll probably pay more than you would for the pork as well because of the because of the cure process is slow that is a that is an artisan product yeah the difference for me is that that's worth eating and that simply isn't okay let's just have a look and that is yeah you were right it is the supermarket one local. free range local meaning yours now if we move over to the carrots i think this is going to be a little bit tougher out of six foods, in all but one case, the apples, when Hugh preferred the taste, it turned out to be locally grown and not from a supermarket. The supermarkets say they also offer high quality products, including the premium brands. We got it right most of the time there, but people will say, but that, it's more expensive. Why should we buy the more expensive? It always comes back to price. You will not get free range organic meat ever as cheap as mm. industrially produced meat and mm. and you shouldn't it's, it's, you know i would be very worried if anyone was selling uh, organic chicken uh, then sort of knock down two for a fiver prices that you that you see in supermarkets for intensively farmed chicken organic food has struggled in the economic downturn producers can't easily reduce their costs because that would usually mean intensifying using the techniques of mass produced food the demand for food labelled organic fell by 13% in 2009. Medium free range eggs. But there's another label which has continued to help sell what's inside it. Cumberland British pork. We're still prepared to pay a premium for British food. Does it have any significance to you if it says made in Britain on the packet? I suppose, yeah, because I trust it more because it's from Britain. Because if it's produced in Britain, it means that maybe they use less preservatives. Quality. It's mean quality for me. So I'd like to think that we're more sustainable and we don't need to ship in things. Look at these sausages produced in Britain. Ten of them for a pound. 
But how do we know they're not really just cheap imports? We bought a random selection of products with the Union Jack, but we're not going to eat them. We're taking them to a laboratory in Germany. They now have the technology to test the isotopes in food, which can tell them where it's really from. Everything we eat has its own unique chemical fingerprint. You can say that every food has a special fingerprint and we are able to show the fingerprint and to compare it with databases. But why is the fingerprint of beef from Britain different from the fingerprint of beef from Brazil, for instance? Because you have different water in England, different feet in England, different geolog geological situation in England, and you see it in the beef. If the technology works, British supermarkets might want to use it to check their own suppliers are selling them what it says on the packet. Each sample was tested and we did find a product whose chemical fingerprint indicated it was from outside the UK. It's more to the Union Jack on the wrapper and said, produced in Britain. It's a packet of sausages we bought in Sainsbury's. When we contacted the supplier, Riley's, in Greater Manchester, they admitted that some of the meat was a cheap foreign import, so the test had got it right. Sainsbury's told us, we're proud of our record on leading the industry in honest and open labelling and aim to be better than any legal requirements. This means there's a clear country of origin labelling on over a thousand of our own label meat products. Riley's told us, we're sure you will find that in the current economic climate, many companies are sourcing their raw materials from overseas. They said the packaging never claimed all the meat was from the UK and they never intended to deceive. Even so, they've changed the label and removed the Union Jack. The company which helped with the test says they could, in the future, empower the consumer. Well, I think that what it'll do is it, it'll encourage the broader population, the, the, the consumer, to demand that what they see on a label is what they get inside the label and it's not some cheaper import or cheaper material that's been fobbed off as being something that it's not. The drive for ever cheaper food isn't just having an impact on our fields and farms, it's changing the landscape of every town in the country. The supermarkets are on the march, transforming the way we live and shop. And tonight, for the first time, Panorama can tell you just how quickly they're expanding. And behind every new store, there's a story. An unlikely battleground, Devon's Jurassic Coast, a world heritage site for fossils. Beyond the beach huts and the shingle, a seaside town called Seaton. If you were cruel, you might say there are fossils on this beach with more life in them than Seaton. And yes, it is fading a bit round the edges and there do appear to be more mobility scooters than there are cars. But Seaton's got something else. It's distinct. It's got an identity. It's managed to hold back the tide of cloned cafes and branded burger bars which have made so many of our high streets indistinguishable. In short, Seaton has kept its soul. But all that could be about to change. There used to be a holiday camp here, a pre-war escape from the big cities, a taste of seaside air. It struggled on into the 21st century. But the developers were circling. Imagine what else could fill the space once it had gone. Sainsbury's did, and so did Tesco. This was Tesco's manor. If we zoom in on the region, take a look at those blue dots. Tesco after Tesco, 13 of them within 21 miles of Seaton. My strong belief is that Tesco want to move here it's because purely they want to stop an alternative store coming into this town. So we had the battle of Tesco's and Sainsbury's here last year and these supermarket wars are obviously happening up and down the country. For the supermarkets, it's all a grand game of strategy. 
about marking out territory. So clearly this is an area where Tesco's have almost completely eliminated any competition. Tesco won the battle for Seaton. Tesco say they have a vision for regenerating the town centre, which will serve local people and help attract thousands of new visitors to the area. I mean, it would be entirely possible to feed the nation through massive superstores and nothing else. That is the sort of uh, direction we're moving in. But it, what's stopping that from happening is, is a resistance on the part of uh, some shoppers who simply don't want it to be like that. But it is a battle. It is, it is a fight. That is what's happening out there. It's a fight not just about expansion, but about the perceived imbalance of power between the supermarket and the local people. One protest movement has evolved in a prosperous market town in the middle of rural Hampshire. There are already several supermarkets nearby. But look at Bishop's Waltham. Is that a gap? Sainsbury's thought so. And this fantastic ruin is what? Uh, this is the palace from the bishops of Winchester and is 900 years old. Goodness me. So there's a lot of history around here. A lot of history, a lot of heritage right on the site. And where's the supermarket going to be? Well, the supermarket is going to be behind this green fence here. Within a few hundred metres of a medieval ruin, plans for a giant Sainsbury's. The monument's owner, English Heritage, is not opposing the plans. But many local shopkeepers are. I think the long-term prospect for me, if a super big supermarket like Sainsbury's was to come, it would be the end of my business in particular. What would people lose, do you think, from Bishop's Wolf and if Sainsbury's appeared? They'll lose the unique specialist shops, I think, like myself. Possibly it would put extra strain on the butcher. Um, the green grocers, the bakers certainly go. It probably will have destroyed the small little village that we have here, but it's going to eventually come, isn't it? So, <laughs> one way or the other, it's going to come. So. And do you shop in supermarkets? Yes, all the time. And, and I bet everybody in Bishop's Waltham does. I bet everybody who are hypocrites turn around and say that they don't, and they do. They all go to Sainsbury's and things like that. They very rarely shop in these shops here, and the people that shop in these shops here are still going to shop in these shops here in time to come, so it's rubbish. Absolute rubbish. <laughs> Sainsbury's say 75% of residents already travel out of town for their main food shop and to help protect the high street it's pledged not to offer services like a coffee shop, a post office, dry cleaning or a pharmacy at its new store. But there's no doubt our high streets are changing. Last year saw the loss of 12,000 independent shops. I think the price being paid for derelict high streets and small towns with hearts ripped out of them is very high. And in the end, uh, it's a high financial price. Uh, it, it actually affects the whole cohesion of society. I think that's not to do with supermarkets or any other one sector. You might as well choose the internet and accuse that of having uh, closed shops on the high street. The customer makes their choice. We can all make a decision as to where we want to shop. But just how fast are the big four expanding? The BBC's carried out a nationwide study, the first of its kind. We approached every planning authority across the UK and asked them how many new supermarkets they've sanctioned over a two-year period, from the small metros right through to the mega stores. Some of them have already been built, and some are on their way to a street near you soon. We obtained figures from 96% of councils. Tesco is way out in front with 392 new stores given planning approval in the last two years. Some old stores have shut and Tesco says most of their new applications are for small local convenience stores. For Asda, the number is 33. Sainsbury's, 111. And for Morrison's, the number's 41. That's a grand total of 577. On average, that means one of the big four gets planning permission in the UK every working day. 
but why are they expanding so quickly? One city analyst says they're in a dash for growth, worried that if they stand still, they'll start to lose ground to each other. And he's concerned just how sustainable it is. Each individual decision uh, seems sensible in itself because each individual decision made by the retailers will go through a very rigorous financial investment appraisal. The problem is you start putting them together and they start biting into each other and there's not enough growth in the market, certainly over the next few years, to satisfy all the growth aspirations of the big retailers. What we do know is in the last 10 years there's been modest, consistent expansion. But remember, this brings investment to parts of Britain, this brings jobs and training, and it also provides choice to customers. And at the end of the day, if customers don't want to shop somewhere, they don't have to. You might wonder why local authorities are allowing so much new build. Well, these are difficult times, and when the council agrees to a new supermarket, it's often getting something else as well. In Seaton, Tesco offered to build a new leisure centre and to fund various arts projects to help persuade the council to say yes. In Bishop's Waltham, Sainsbury's will be building a new doctor's surgery if they get permission for their supermarket. And the provision of extra facilities isn't unusual, particularly as councils scratch around for money during the downturn. This was also part of our BBC study. Panorama's found that at least one in five of those stores given approval over the last two years have involved something called planning gain. It's a type of agreement that local authorities strike with big businesses when they want to set up shop in the local area. There's always a, a, an issue of negotiating, of bargaining, to try and get a good deal for the local community. Some agreements we discovered are staggering in their size. In Gateshead, Tesco is spending 150 million to redevelop the town and to get permission to build their supermarkets. The big four are building swimming pools, libraries, schools, even a Tesco-built police station. In these hard times, every little helps. This is all part of the deal to help them ease the way, if you like. It, it often is, yes, because let's not forget, retailers are at the heart of the community. They're as keen, because they're going to be employing local people, they're going to be serving uh, local shoppers, they want to be part of this community, and I think this is very helpful and shows what good retailers are doing at local level. The big four get their record floor space, we get new civic amenities, and of course, what we all love, affordable food. Do you shop in supermarkets? Yes. All the time. When you go to a big supermarket, everything you need is going to be there, so just convenience. It's cheaper than the local convenience store. Just got everything in the supermarket. But it's cheaper. Why else? You've <laughs> caught us in a moment of weakness. Yeah. <laughs> and we're sorry, we'll put it all back. Come on. <laughs> The choices we make about what we eat have a, a profound impact on the countryside, on the high streets of our towns and cities, on the very fabric of British life. The reality is it's us who are driving the biggest expansion of supermarkets in British retail history. Which of the big scientific breakthroughs would be on your top ten? Professor Robert Winston has a list of his own. How Science Changed Our World, tomorrow at 8 on BBC One and BBC One HD.